Kubernetes architecture can be broken down into two parts. The control plane components, which include the controller manager, API server, etc. and scheduler, and the node components, which include kubelet, the kube proxy, and container runtime. The control plane components provide the core Kubernetes services and orchestration of the application workloads, while the actual application workload run on the node components. In Azure Kubernetes service, control plane is automatically created, configured, and managed by Azure. There are four main services running in the control plane. Kube API server is how the underlying Kubernetes APIs are exposed. This component provides the interaction for management tools such as kubectl. Etz is used to maintain the state of your Kubernetes cluster and its configuration. This highly available service is a key value store within Kubernetes. Kube Controller Manager oversees a number of smaller controllers that perform actions such as replicating pods and handling node operations. When you create or scale applications, the Kube Scheduler determines what nodes can run the workloads and starts them there. On the agent node component side, we have Kubelet, which is a Kubernetes agent that processes the orchestration request from the control plane and schedule the requested containers. Virtual networking is handled by Kube proxy on each node. The proxy routes network traffic and manages IP addresses for services and pods. The container runtime is a component that allows containerized applications to run and interact with additional resources such as virtual network and storage. Now that you know some of the components and their high-level functionality, let us see how these components talk to each other when you issue a command to create a new Kubernetes deployment. Do not worry if this ends up looking very complicated. You do not need to remember all of this. Just remember there are multiple subcomponents with very well-defined function for each of them. In step one, kubectl gives a pod deployment manifest to the API server. The API server then creates a deployment resource and that info is saved in Etset. Deployment controller watches for any new deployment resources and creates the replica set resource. Then replica set controller watches for any new replica set resources. Replica set controller creates the pod resource based on how many replicas set and actual pods are present. In steps 6 and 7, Kube Scheduler watches for unbound pod resources and schedules them on a target node. Then, Kubelet calls Container Runtime Interface and Container Network Interface to create a pod and container with networking configured. In steps 9 and 10, CRI calls Host Compute Layer also called HCS, to create container and host networking service called HNS to create the endpoint. Finally, in steps 11 and 12, QProxy watches for any new endpoint and programs HNS with load balancer and access control list. We have Docker for desktop installed on our machine. You can obtain a copy from docker.com. Keep in mind that Docker for desktop has certain licensing terms but for our learning purposes, we are simply utilizing it to understand Kubernetes and that's in line with terms of use. Using the settings option, I have enabled Kubernetes. This will bootstrap the necessary components to set up a single node local Kubernetes cluster on my PC. We will test our application in the local Kubernetes cluster before we deploy this to AKS. We have also installed .NET Core 6 which we can confirm by running the command .NET dash dash list SDKs. We will be building a sample web application using .NET Core and to build this, I prefer to use a JetBrains IDE called Rider. You may very well choose to use Visual Studio Code, Visual Studio or for that matter any text editor. You can use any language of your choice as long as you can wrap it in a container image. I tend to normally write C Sharp code so that's what I will choose for now. Let's start by opening up Rider and click on New Solution. We will choose the ASP.NET Core Web Application Template, give our solution a name, for example, Code Cloud App, and I will select the option to choose Put Solution Project in the same directory, as our solution will only have one project. 
in the type we will select web app and here is the most important part we will let the ide in this case rider create a docker file for our application since dotnet core is cross platform we can run it either on linux or windows but we will stick to linux containers in this course okay so we have our project ready i'm just going to modify the code a bit which allows us to read the configuration data from the files or even from environment variables to do this under pages we will expand the index.chtml page to open index.chtml.cs file this represents the code behind our index.chtml file in other words the model that can be consumed in our pages in the constructor of the index model i will add one more parameter of type i configuration calling it just configuration we will then generate a read only field called underscored configuration this will allow us to read configuration data for example we can read data of app settings.json file now back on our index.chtml.cs file let's define a property called message of type string the on get method is called when you get the get request on the index page this is where we will set the value of the message property to read from configuration store and also ensure that if in case we get a null value we return a value of hello world let me create a property called message in app settings.json and we will then set the value to hello world from app settings.json now in our index.chtml file we will simply inject a p tag that will call the message property of the model class using the razor syntax that's it now let's run the application and test it first as you can see we have a simple asp.net core web app that displays a message from the configuration store which in this case is app settings just json file Let's keep the web app running and I will change the value of the message to something else. Let's say hello world changed and then come back to our web page and refresh the page. The updated value is now reflected in our web page. This is pure awesomeness. <laughs> okay. Let me stop the web page and let us now focus on the docker file. What you see on the screen is an example of the multi-stage docker build. In other words, We use the SDK image to build and generate the DLLs for our app and then use a the runtime image to run it. By doing so, we create less layers and thereby minimize the size of our application. Let's create the Docker image using the docker build command. In the terminal, we are in the directory where our project files are stored, which can be confirmed by a quick ls command. Now, to build the docker image, we will run the docker build and specify a dot to let the docker cli find the docker file in the current directory and then use the dash t switch to tag the image as code cloud app version 1 this will kick off the docker build process and once all the steps are completed we should have the docker image of our application we can see this image when you run the docker image ls command beautiful Now we have the image of our application ready. We can deploy this to our local Kubernetes cluster. Now, if you're not familiar with .NET Core, that's perfectly fine. You can pull the image we built in this clip using the Docker Hub repo. The link is up on your screen. Now that we have the container image for our Core Cloud app, let's run a container based on this image. To do so, we will leverage the Docker run command. specify the dash t switch to run this as a daemon and expose the application at port 8080 of the local host by mapping port 8080 to the target port of port 80 which the application serves the request on finally let's specify the name of the image to use which in our case will be core cloud app v1 to check the status of our container let's run a quick docker ls Our application is up and running and to verify that let's navigate on our browser and browse to local host port 8080. This is brilliant.
we can now see our application up and running. Now let me show you something interesting. If you remember, we use the .NET Core's I configuration interface to read the configuration data from the app settings.json. So what will happen if I execute into this container, change the contents of the app settings.json file within the Docker container, and let's refresh the page. Well, let's see. Let me run docker exec dash it and specify the first few characters of the container that make it unique, which is just BD in our case, and then provide a bash terminal to log in. Now that our image is pretty thin and does not have the Vim utility installed, so let me install the Vim utility by running the command apt install Vim. Once the Vim is installed, we will use it to edit our app settings.json file change the value of the message property to hello from Vim, save the changes and exit out of the editor. Now the Docker container is still running. So let's refresh our page and voila, you can see the updated message in our app. No rocket science here, but just wanted to show you the simplicity of .NET Core and its configuration binding. Having said that, the configuration binding prefers to read the environment variables at the end. So if there is a conflict, it can overwrite the value it reads from the config file to that from an environment variable. Let's test that out as well. Let me delete the container we just created using the docker rm-f and use the command to list the container IDs, which would be docker ps dash dash q and pass it as an argument to docker rm command. Cool. Now that we have the docker container deleted, Let's create a new one, but this time we will append a new switch called dash E, which will allow us to pass environment variables to the container at runtime and specify a value of, let's say, from environment. Great. Let's connect to our application. And now you see the message that says, hello from environment. So the environment variable we passed overrides the value we specified in app settings as JSON. Finally, let us clean up by deleting the container we just created using the command docker rm. In the last clip, we saw how to run our application locally using docker CLI. Now let's use the kubectl utility to deploy our app to a local Kubernetes cluster. Let me first verify the version of Kubernetes running on our local cluster by using the command kubectl version. This is the latest version of Kubernetes at the time of recording this course. Next, we will use a kubectl deploy command to create a deployment called Code Cloud App. Specify the image as Code Cloud App colon v1 and set the number of replicas to 2. Beautiful. Let's verify if the deployment is successful by running kubectl get deploy command. Great. You can see the two of our two replicas are up and running. Now, to connect to our deployment, we will need to expose it via a service. To do so, we will use the kubectl expose command, specify our deployment code cloud app, then in the type, we will specify load balancer. In the port field, we will give it a value of 8080 and set the target port to 80. Notice, this is similar to the docker CLI command we used in the previous video to specify that we want to map port 8080 of the host to port 80 of the container. Technically, we're not creating a load balancer on our local Kubernetes cluster. In fact, it will actually create a service of the type node port. But we will use this command later to create a cloud load balancer when using AKS. Let's run the command and you can see that we have now our service created. Let's go ahead and verify this by running the kubectl get service command. All right, now let's navigate to our browser and you can see we have our application up and running. But one thing we can't figure out, how do we know which replica is serving this request? As we have specified two replicas in our deployment, it would be great if we can specify the machine name where our application is running so we know which pod is serving our request when we are using the load balancer. This is a problem that we can easily fix.
let's navigate back to our application code and make some changes to display the machine name. All we need to do is go to index.chtml file and let's add a new p tag. Here, I will use a .NET course environment class to read the value of the machine name, the solidies. So in our web app, after we display the message on the next line, it will display the name of the machine slash pod slash container that is serving this application. With our changes saved, let's create a new image for our application. To do so, let's navigate to our terminal and use the docker build command, but this time we will tag the image as Core Cloud App version 2. This will kick off the build process and this should complete quickly as we already have some of the layers cached. Cool. With our image now available, let's verify it by running the command docker image ls. Great. We now see two images of our application Code Cloud App colon v1 and Code Cloud App colon v2. Now let's use a version 2 of the application to create a new deployment. But before we do that, let's delete the service and deployment we created with version 1 of the image. To do so, let's use the kubectl delete service and kubectl delete deployment command respectively. Now let's use the kubectl create deployment command, but this time we will specify the version 2 of the Core Cloud app image we just created and specify the number of replicas to 2. Once again, let's create a service by using the kubectl expose command and verify its status using the kubectl get service command. Once done, let's navigate to our browser again and connect to local port 8080. As you can see, apart from the message, we also have name of the pod or machine name serving our request. Let us open an in private window and navigate to localhost 8080 and you can see the name of the machine is different from what we see in the previous window. Let me drag it below so you can see clearly that our load balancer service is serving the request from two different pods that are powering our deployment. I will use the same technique to add another field called IP address on our source page and save it to my GitHub repository. The link for the repository is on your screen.